So the dramatic point in John's gospel comes in John chapter 11. John structures his whole gospel around seven signs. He doesn't call them miracles, but he calls them signs because they point to a deeper revelation about the nature of Jesus Christ. And chapter 11 is the story of the raising of Lazarus from the dead. So we're going to hear from the end of that story, verses 38 through 44, when Jesus actually goes to Lazarus' tomb itself and calls forth his friend. Listen to God's word. Then Jesus, again greatly disturbed, moved, came to the tomb. And it was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench, because he has been dead for four days. And Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you, if you believed, you would see the glory of God? And so they took away the stone. And Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I know that you always hear me, but I've said this for the sake of the crowd standing here so that they may believe that you sent me. And when Jesus had said this, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth and his face wrapped in a cloth. And Jesus said to the others, unbind him and let him go. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. One of the most important jobs as a pastor is to work with families when they're planning funeral services. People will call me and tell me the news that a loved one has died, and almost, in almost every case, they will follow that up by saying, I'm really not sure what happens now. I've never had to do this before. I've never had to plan a funeral before. And so along with comforting in their loss, one of my roles, and for Heather and Patrice, is to talk them through the general logistics associated with a funeral. We'll talk about, do you wish to have a visitation or not? Are you looking to have the loved one embalmed or cremated? Are you looking to have a burial in a cemetery or a scattering of the ashes? Now you can go through all of these details and you can work them all out in advance, but I should also acknowledge that there are times when things simply don't go as they're planned. In any human event, in any human occasion, there are moments of both chance or things going astray. There are times when the funeral director has been late in delivering the casket to the funeral. There was one funeral I did where they literally had dug the grave in the wrong spot. And I recently did a memorial service at a cemetery with a family. At the very end, we took the urn of the beloved's ashes, and we set it in the columbarium. And we watched then as the cemetery workers picked up the marble stone and slowly put it into place over the niche. But when they put the stone up there, we all recognized that they would misspelled the person's name on the stone. Now, in that moment, we could have been stoic Presbyterians and pretended not to notice, or we could have been a little more animated and raised a big stink about it. But I quietly pulled the cemetery workers aside and told them of the mistake, and they were actually able to switch two of the brass letters that had been affixed in the wrong place and quietly correct the misspelling in front of the family. Now, that wasn't ideal, it wasn't how we wanted to end that funeral service, but it was a reminder. A reminder that life is at times messy and imperfect, and if we patiently can work together, we can usually make things right. The story of Lazarus is one of the most dramatic stories in the entire Bible. In this chapter, chapter 11, Jesus is going to receive word that his dear friend Lazarus is dying. 
But Jesus is going to wait a few more days before actually traveling to Bethany. When he arrives in the city, he's going to be met by Lazarus's two sisters, Martha and Mary, who bring him the sad news that Lazarus has died. That's the point in the story where we have the famous verse, Jesus wept, as he stood there among the friends and family members of Lazarus. At that point, then, he also offers very powerful words of faith. He says to them, I am the resurrection and the life. Everyone who believes in me, yet though they die, they shall live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. And once he says those words, he turns and he faces the tomb of his friend Lazarus, and he orders those standing nearby to take away the stone. Now, as I mentioned, sometimes at funerals, there are unintentional moments of awkwardness. But let it be clear, this command from Jesus to roll away the stone was not unintended. Instead, it was quite intentional. And so much so that Martha literally breaks in and tries to dissuade Jesus, noting that By this time, there'll be an unpleasant stench from the tomb. All right, a somewhat humorous side note about this story, as much as it can have humor in it. The early Christians, the first couple centuries, they would bury their dead in the catacombs. Alongside those tombs, though, they would put in paintings or frescoes of famous Bible stories. So it's where we get some of the earliest representations, not only of Jesus, but of the stories of the New Testament. Well, if they would paint a picture of the story of Lazarus coming out of the tomb, in order to distinguish it from any depiction of Jesus coming from the tomb on Easter, They would often show Lazarus there still wrapped in his burial cloths, and all the people standing around him they would show holding their nose. (laughs) So anyway, Martha is there beside Jesus, literally trying to keep the grave closed. Whatever Jesus has in mind, she's really not quite sure she's going to like it. Gracia Grindel is a seminary professor, a Lutheran, and she said this, Sometimes people fear resurrection more than they fear death. Finality has a certain comfort to it, at least we know what to do. But resurrection and the changes that it brings will always be frightful to people if they're intent on always being in control. Sometimes we fear resurrection. We stand right next to Martha, and we too object when Jesus comes along and steps into the dark places of our lives and points at that which we would prefer be kept buried and announces, no, take away the stone. If we're honest, we all have parts in our lives that we keep hidden behind heavy stones unresolved conflicts, lost friendships, broken relationships, sometimes memories of abuse or ill treatment, secret addictions kept from others, repressed anger or painful rejections. On some level, there is a cold comfort to the finality that says, well, all those things are over and done with, dead and buried. They won't see the light of day again. And that's what we tell ourselves But the reality, as we all know, is that those who die are never fully gone from us, and that which we bury is never truly gone. So there's the voice of Jesus. He's telling us, take away the stone. And he's speaking to us both as individuals and collectively. He speaks with a voice of comfort, seeking healing for us when he's speaking to us personally. But he's also speaking with a voice of prophetic courage when he's referring to the ways that we live that are unjust or oppressive of others. He says, take away the stone, and in that command, the strength is found for the hashtag Me Too and the stories to finally break the silence around sexual abuse and misogyny. 
He says, take away the stone, and so people take to the streets to affirm that black lives matter, that migration laws in this country remain unjust, that prejudicial treatment against Asian Americans and indigenous peoples must finally end. And after he says that, he also says, I am the resurrection and the life, a message that's as much about this life as it is about the life to come. What Jesus is doing is calling us to remove impediments, to take away the stones, to strike down the laws, to flood the places of darkness with light, the light of faith, the light of compassion, the light of hope, the light of justice. The command to take away the stone, it's not just pulpit rhetoric, it's a literal concrete form of spiritual discipline. Miriam Kaba is an African-American grassroots activist and organizer in New York, and she said this. She says, hope is a discipline but it's one that's hard to maintain. To keep hope for the future alive, we have to consider that it might still be uncertain. We have to believe that only concerted collective human action may yet avert disaster. Now, I would amend her quote to say, to keep hope alive, we have to believe that by God's grace and concerted human action, disasters can be averted. By grace and action, justice is possible. Change happens. Stones are rolled away, and resurrection becomes a reality, now and hereafter. Madeleine Albright, the first woman Secretary of State, recently died. In one of the articles talking about her legacy, it mentioned that she traveled to the Czech Republic in 1995 to celebrate the 50-year anniversary of the liberation of that land from Nazi Germany. During a parade, many people lined the streets as she went down and waved American flags as she passed. But to her surprise, some of the flags only had 48 stars in them. It turned out that American GIs had handed out flags a half century earlier, and some of the Czech families had kept those flags hidden in their homes during all the years of the Soviet domination. And then they had passed those flags down to their children as a discipline of hope, as a symbol and a reminder of freedom and a better future that was possible. Whenever Jesus says, take away the stone, what he's doing is calling us to life. He's calling us to step away from the shadows and the brokenness and the buried secrets and the structural injustice. He's calling to us to wave the flag of freedom, no matter how long delayed, to exhale the stench of death and to fill our lungs with the fresh air of hope, to move from tombs to then life in fullest, what God intends for each of us and for all of us. And just in case we miss the message after Jesus had them remove the impediment of the stone, basically the exact same thing happens a second time once he calls Lazarus out of the tomb. Now, you have to picture this. Jesus calls to Lazarus, he only uses two words. He basically says, Lazarus, outside. And there he was, resuscitated yet still wrapped in burial cloths and ribbons of death. And frankly, as he stood there, at that moment, the verdict was still out on whether this was a good idea or not. No one was rushing forward, and I imagine a very long pause in the dramatic action as everyone standing there is trying to wrap their heads around what is happening. So what does Jesus do? Jesus does what he always does. He turns to us. The resurrection call to life is never something that only happens 
because of Christ. That only happens as a voice speaking from heaven. As Richard Rohr said in his book, Radical Grace, though Jesus brings us to life, he needs us to unbind Lazarus. We share in the power of resurrection. That is the meaning of our church, the meaning of our call. That is both the burden and the joy of human history. See, after ordering the stone to be rolled away and then calling the dead man from darkness into light, Jesus turns to us and he says, Unbind him and let him go. Unbind the cloths that are keeping him from walking. Unbind and take away the cloth over his eyes that make it hard to see clearly. Take off the chains that remain. Step away from the fears. Reject the addictions, the hatreds, the doubts, the punitive spirits. Repeal the laws and ordinances that diminish the world around you. And then come out. Come out of your individual and collective tombs and unbind one another as Christ's disciples. See, that's the power of this whole passage and of the message that it offers. In Christ Jesus, we are called to life, and we cannot do it alone. We're called to life, and that involves a discipline of hope, of believing in something year after year after year. And we're called to life of hearing the call of Christ that cannot be ignored no matter how thick the stones are we've placed up to bury ourselves in our tombs. And then we're called to unbind others, even as we allow others to unbind us. We're called to life, and we cannot do it alone. The movement from death to life literally happens every day. Jesus calls us to remove impediments, stones, stench, bindings, whatever would keep us locked in our tomb. And then Jesus puts us to work, unbinding others on his behalf, by his grace, to the glory of God. So don't fear resurrections. Because they're at the heart of who we are and what we believe. And they're true today and for every day. Thanks be to God. Amen.